Contemporary artists have responded in a number of ways to the traditional representation of the body and to the theory of the male gaze. Vali Export used her body to create works that challenged the traditional passive role of women's bodies in art and film. In her 1973 performance, Erosion, she rolled her naked body over an area of broken glass. She proceeded to pass over a smooth sheet of glass, finishing up on a paper screen. This range of movement was repeated for approximately 10 minutes. Her intention was, as she said, to change the male gaze. The man sees you naked, yet he cannot see you the way he wants to see a naked female body. Okay, Marta, pause the video here and discuss the ways in which Export's action disrupts the male gaze and subverts the traditional female mood. By inflicting a series of cuts upon her body, Export disrupts and upsets the erotic anticipation of the male gaze. Additionally, by enacting the body as the bearer of self-inflicted wounds, the implications and meanings of the naked female body change. Export aggressively releases her body from socially mandated constraints and allows it to bleed onto the paper beneath her, effectively challenging cultural expectations related to the naked female body. Compare this work to Eve Klein's Anthropometries. What are some of the similarities and what are the key differences? Even though Export's Erosion and Klein's Anthropometries share some visual similarities, they convey fundamentally different ideas. In his Anthropometries, Klein's dominance over his female models was tangible. The models were present solely to enact the requests of the dominant male artist, fulfilling the archetypal role of the objectified and passive female. This situation stands in stark contrast to Export's Erosion. Whereas Klein's models served a predominantly submissive and visual role that conformed to the expectations of the male gaze, Export's use of the female body actively subverted and confused the same gaze. Export also addressed the sexual politics of cinema by subverting the role of the passive female as an object in one of her most controversial works, Action Pants, Genital Panic, during which she marched into a film house in Munich wearing pants with the crutch cut out. Walking up and down the aisles among the mostly male patrons, she challenged them to look at the real thing instead of passively enjoying the naked women on screen. So what exactly do you think Export's intention was with this action? According to Export, some of the people in the audience got up, or at least the ones at the back because they could get out the easiest. The fact that this was reality was something unbearable to them. The action was designed to challenge the voyeurism of cinema. I was trying to develop a completely new, non-voyeuristic approach to the female body as something other than a visual object. I wanted to find out what happened when you leave behind this voyeuristic mode and confront people with reality. But the fact of the matter is, they just walked away from it. That's what was so interesting for me to discover. People don't want to see reality. When something is constructed, when it's projected onto a screen, it's acceptable. But it's different when it's there in front of you in a public place. Export extended the action to posters where she's pictured sitting wearing the same pants, but also carrying a machine gun. With her hair wildly teased, she stares directly into the camera. So what do you think the significance of the gun is in this photograph? Like export, body artist Gina Pane also subjected her body to physical pain to make a political statement. Feminist scholar Peggy Phelan has suggested that the best body art of the 1970s employed endurance and physical pain as tools for exploring bodily limits. For her, Body artists claimed their own bodies as a medium and a metaphor for the relationship between self and other, performer and spectator, art and life, and life and death. In the early 1970s, Gina Pane became famous for her multimedia performances, 
which often included discreet acts of self-mutilation. As a member of the body art movement, Pane defined all of her performances as actions, whose meaning materialised through her bodily engagement. Pane interpreted her performances of ritualised pain as sacrificial acts in which she attempted to strip her audience of its willful or defensive refusal to engage in the grim realities of contemporary life. In her 1971 studio performance, Anaesthetised Escalation, Pane climbed with bare hands and feet, a ladder whose rungs were lined with jagged edged metal pieces to protest the escalation of the Vietnam War. Seemingly masochistic, the performance lasted for half an hour when the artist, bleeding profusely, reached a state of exhaustion and was no longer able to continue. Rebecca Horn also explores the body, but in a slightly different way, as a response to her own physical trauma. After becoming hospitalised for several months in 1968-69, to Horn became interested in distressed bodies, and her series of hospital drawings depicts human forms with various physical constraints or prosthetic attachments. Many of the elongated appendages depicted in the hospital drawings were subsequently constructed by the artist out of fabric, feathers, metal and wood, and then used as props in performances that investigate the relationship between a body, its surrounding space and the senses. A common theme in Horn's work is sensory perception and especially the experience of physical touch. Horn has described how wearing her finger gloves altered her relationship with her surroundings so that the distant objects came within her reach. She says, the finger gloves are light. I can move them without any effort. I can feel me touching. I can see me grasping. I control the distance between me and the objects. Implicit in the work is the idea that touching makes possible an intimacy between our own body and those of others. Strapped around the face, this pencil mask transforms the wearer's head into an instrument for drawing. Horn has described wearing it. All pencils are about two inches long and produce a profile of my face in three dimensions. I move my body rhythmically from left to right in front of a white wall. The pencils make marks on the wall, the image of which corresponds to the rhythm of my movements. The spike-like pencils make this one of Horn's more threatening works. However, it's also linked to her feather masks, as feather quills were also once used for writing. Okay, pause the video here, Marta, and discuss Horn's cock feather mask. How do you think the mask feels to wear, and how would it impact on your personal interactions? Horn has described how her cockfeather mask alters her interaction with others. With the feathers, I caress the face of a person standing close to me. The intimate space between us is filled with tactile tension. My sight is obstructed by the feathers. I can only see the face of the other when I turn my head looking with one eye like a bird. Through her mimicry of bird movements, Horn suggests the use of plumage as a device for communication and sexual display. In contemporary art, the body has been thoroughly reworked by both male and female artists in ways that deviate from traditional formulas. The exaltation of human bodies was once considered the artist's highest calling. Today, artistic celebrations of bodily perfection are likely to be dismissed as ideologically suspicious. The rejection of idealised bodies in art has happened right alongside society's demand for physical perfection expressed in the media and in pop culture. Contemporary artists react to these impossible standards 
by depicting bodies that are not beautiful, but ordinary, imperfect, sometimes even ugly or deformed. Lucian Freud's figures couldn't be further from the idealised figures of old. Instead, his lusciously painted figures border on the grotesque. Freud emphasises the imperfections of the human flesh with rolls of fat, dimpled skin and blotchy complexions. Other figures present unmistakable signs of age with protruding hip bones, strange cavities that hollow out cheeks or thighs, and huge calloused feet that thrust awkwardly toward the viewer. The subjects squat, sprawl or sag, and often seem equally male and female as emphasised by a series of paintings of the late cross-dressing performance artist Lee Bowery. What they are not is seductive and sexually enticing. In this, Freud's figures seem like textbook cases in the self-conscious nakedness that Kenneth Clark opposed to the idealised and aestheticised nude. The same self-conscious nakedness can be found in the work of Hannah Wilk, who was known in the 70s for her nude performances which defied the role of the female body as a passive fantasy object. Later, when she was dying of lymphoma, Wilk presented images of her disease-ravaged body in a series of photographs and videos. Okay, pause the video and discuss how Hannah Wilk's work, Intravenous, subverts traditional representations of the female nude. How does it breach the boundary between art and life? and even life and death. The photographs, sculptures, videos, and performances that she produced examine and critique the depiction of women and female sexuality within art history and popular culture. She often pictured herself and performed nude, using coded feminine gestures and poses to subvert archetypes, ranging from the fashion model to Mary Magdalene. She died in 1993 following a multi-year battle with lymphoma, which she and her husband Donald Goddard documented during the last few years of her life, producing ultimately over 30 hours of video. Prior to her death, Wilka drew up rough plans for their installation, which was only realized in this form by Goddard in 2008. The videos run simultaneously and progress chronologically from the top left corner of the grid to the bottom right. Called the intravenous tapes, this work anticipates the confessional mode of more recent popular culture and social media. But without the scripted structures and familiar narrative forms that increasingly codify these presentations of so-called real life. Against that false authenticity, Wilka presents the performance of her own life in art, in this case adulterated only by illness. She addresses the camera with the same charisma and self-possession that characterized her earlier work, still refusing to be defined by her body and its appearance, and assuming a surprising dignity even in decline. No longer presenting the ideal feminine image, these images display a swollen and bruised body, deformed by cancer treatment. For her and her peers, Depicting the nude became a way to assert control over society's attitudes towards sexuality, gender relationships, and the ideals of physical beauty. When examining socially prescribed gender norms, it's helpful to take a look at Judith Butler's theory of gender performativity. Butler explores the significance of performativity in the development of individual subjectivity and gender formation and explores the idea of the body as a fluid construction whose subjectivity is not fixed but is continually formed over time. In other words, gender is not something that is innate, but rather something that we continually seek to acquire. It's one thing to say that gender is performed, and that's a little different from saying gender is performative. When we say gender is performed, we usually mean that we've taken on a role, we're acting in some way. Um, and that our acting or our role playing is crucial to the gender that we are and the gender that we present to the world. To say that gender is performative is a little different because for something to be performative means that it produces a series of effects. We act and walk and speak and talk in ways that mm, consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. We act as if that being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or 
something that's simply true about us, a fact about us. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. There's a real question for me about how such gender norms get established and policed and what the best way is to disrupt them and to overcome the police function. It's my view that uh, gender is, a, is, is culturally formed, but it's also a domain of agency or freedom. It's most important to resist the violence that is imposed by ideal gender norms, especially against those who are gender different, who are non-conforming non in, their, in their gender presentation. Many artists challenge and disrupt ideal gender norms, including British artist Sarah Lucas, whose self-portrait photographs and sculptures present an identity which challenges stereotypical representations of gender and sexuality. The seminal Eating a Banana changed Lucas's perception of her masculine appearance to something she could use in her art. She said, I suddenly could see the strength of the masculinity about it. The usefulness of it to the subject struck me at that point, and since then I've used that. The resulting confrontational self-portrait photographs made throughout the 1990s complement her sculptural and installation work. Through them, she presents an identity which challenges stereotypical representations of gender and sexuality. Here's Whitechapel Gallery director Iwona Blazwick discussing Lucas's work for the artist's first retrospective exhibition. And the beginning of the exhibition brings together some of her most iconic and famous works. We see her signature use of found objects, fruit, furniture, clothing, transformed as if by magic into analogues for the sexualized body. Seated throughout the exhibition are Sarah Lucas's bunnies, inspired by the Playboy bunny empire of Hugh Hefner and his soft porn magazines. Her bunnies are lacking heads. They're made out of stuffed tights. Their bunny ears have flopped and collapsed. This bunny is clamped to a chair. She isn't very sexy. She's rather abject. She's having a face-to-face -face with a figure over here, King Canute. He sat on the toilet. A toilet for Lucas is something which relates her work to Marcel Duchamp and is a metaphor for the human body and for life itself in this rather bleak evocation of life in the city. It's striking that all of Sarah Lucas's figures lack heads, but there is one face that dominates throughout the exhibition, and that is of the artist herself. She floats as a mobile, she appears as wallpaper. She's looking at us, laughing at us, challenging us. The artist here is the omnipresent goddess. At the heart of the Sarah Lucas exhibition, in this extraordinary crimson room, giant male torsos wallpaper the gallery. And masculinity here is enlarged into this almost godlike proportions, but at the same time shrunk into these edible phallic stand ins. This is a room which reminds us of Francis Bacon's Studies for a Crucifixion, and right at the heart of it is a dead, crushed car leaning up against that one of Lucas's most iconic works, O Naturel. The man represented by vegetables, the woman by fruit and a bucket. It's the abject, it's the everyday, in dialogue with the epic. <laughs> 